to Good Libations, our show about mixology. I'm Ethel Andrews, and as you know, I'm a mixologist. And in my previous shows about Campari in Italian cocktails like the Negroni, I briefly mentioned the fact that I just might abandon the term mixology because it's taken on sort of a, shall we say, snob appeal type of a connotation. And some true mixologists are abandoning the term for that very reason and going back to bartender because it sounds less pretentious. It's unfortunate that sometimes that happens, that things take on a bad connotation, but sometimes they do. And in these series of shows that I'm going to do, we are going to make a couple of drinks. In fact, we're going to remake a couple of drinks to kind of tone down the sweetness and the cloyingness of them. But I'm also going to talk on this particular episode specifically about glassware and appropriate barware. And by no means is this the entire collection of barware that a mixologist bartender should have. I only brought a few items because basically these few items can be used for pretty much any drink, any wine, any cocktail, any beer. But we do want to have a more exhaustive, you might say, repertoire of glassware to use other than just what we have here. And one thing I want to mention from the outset is the importance of having truly clean glassware and clean barware anyway. And that's not just simply for sanitary purposes, but also for the appearance of drinks and the enjoyment of them. I think we've all had a beer presented to us or a lovely microbrewed ale of some sort where there's hardly any head on it and not much carbonation that's coming up. And that usually results from a dirty glass or a glass that has been improperly rinsed. So this is a beer glass of sorts. There are many other beer glasses like Pilsner glasses, beer mugs, and of course the lovely um, glasses that are usually served that are kind of V-shaped in a microbrewery. But it's important to hand wash them and wash them thoroughly and rinse them in hot water very thoroughly and let them air dry. And if they're properly washed and rinsed when they air dry and are ready to use, there should be no spots, no streaks, no residue. And then when you pour beer, you'll get a nice hat on the beer. You can see the little strings of carbonation coming up and it'll be so much more refreshing and so much nicer. Because again, that's a big problem, is dirty glassware. And it has to be thoroughly washed, again I emphasize, and thoroughly rinsed in hot water, and just laid out to dry, which it will do so quickly. And of course, you can put beer mugs and glasses in a freezer, especially if you're gonna serve lagers and pilsners, any beer that is typically served cold, that, of course, is not necessary if you're serving ales, stouts, or porters, because usually they're around 55 degrees, or they should be. And also, if we're serving wine, this is what could be termed a sort of all-purpose wine glass. Now, idyllically, if we're serving red wines, we want one with a bigger, um, you might say, glass area because we want to be able to let that wine breathe. We want to be able to get the bouquet off the wine. And we also, it also needs a little bit, believe it or not, of warmth from our hands to really enhance a good red varietal. And with whites, this is an ideal glass for whites also because it has a long enough stem that you can keep your hand off the base of the glass or the um, base of the actual glass part itself so that you're not compromising the wine and getting it to be too warm because that's very important also. You could even use this to serve champagne although a champagne flute would be much more desirable. However, never ever use those dish-shaped champagne glasses that were ever so popular in the 50s and 60s especially at weddings because you're losing all the bubbles. The presentation is all wrong, especially for 
a very expensive or even decent champagne. That is not the way to serve it. But you could even use this because this is an all-purpose glass for champagne. And then cocktail-wise, this is only three cocktail glasses here. Typically, we would also need a parfait-shaped glass, like a hurricane glass, which is used to serve hurricanes or some tropical drinks. But this particular glass, the chimney glass, which, as everyone who watches this show knows, is my favorite, is ideal for mixed drinks, for tropical drinks, for all kinds of different cocktails. It, because it exhibits the drink beautifully, it has enough volume in it, but not too much volume. And the ice stacks very nicely within the drink. So this is a good all-purpose glass. And the same could be said for the old-fashioned glass, which could be used to serve Negronis, whiskey sours, all kinds of different drinks. And of course, the old-fashioned. And there are double old-fashioned glasses, but this particular one, which holds eight ounces of liquid, is the typical one that is used. And again, it's a good all-purpose barware glass. And then a good all-purpose glass is what is typically known as a martini glass. But this glass can also be used to serve cocktails because, again, it exhibits them beautifully in addition to martinis. It could also be used, as I typically do, for margaritas, although you can use a traditional margarita glass also. So this is a nice glass to have. It's an all-purpose glass for those typical purposes. But idyllically, again, it's better to have the separate types of glassware if you can. But this just goes to show, too, that you don't have to. You don't have to buy professional barware and have this huge stock of everything that is not necessary. Just a few things are necessary in mind when you uh, stock your bar with glassware. And also, as we make drinks, we're going to talk a bit about garnishes and the need for appropriate garnishes. Garnishes don't just look pretty in a drink, but they also contribute essential oils from the peels of the fruit infused into the drink, and they serve other purposes too. So appropriate garnishes and the displaying of them is an important aspect of making truly fine cocktails. So keep these things in mind, and again, the same as with beer glasses. Make sure that your cocktail glasses are properly hand-washed, properly rinsed in hot water, allowed to air dry and cool. And some of them you may want to cool down a bit in a freezer or a refrigerator. And the same principles also with ice storage. At parties, if people do not have proper refrigeration, you could always use an insulated bag, you can use an ice chest, but use something to store your ice correctly and keep it really cold and ready to use. So keep these things in mind because little things mean a lot as the old uh, cliche goes. It's true. It's really true. And recognize the importance of them and the reasons why we do them. And again, I always want to thank you for tuning into this show. I'm Ethel Andrews. I'm a mixologist bartender. And when we enjoy our cocktails, we always want to exercise moderation in what we do because we want to keep our own reputations and the reputation of our family good. And we want to keep the reputation of our community good and keep our community well spoken of. These things are very important. And as we proceed on with this series of shows to make cocktails, we're going to talk a bit more about toning down excessive sweetness in a cocktail. Now, some people love sweet drinks, but I do not. And usually the more sophisticated a person's palate is, the less they're going to enjoy a sweet cocktail. And it's amazing. Some sweet drinks, if they're toned down and made less sweet, are really attractive and appealing and very tasty without that cloying, sugary edge. So thank you again for tuning in. Goodbye.